Hello everyone. Reshma Saujani is the founder of Girls Who Code, a nonprofit organization that provides coding education to middle school and high school girls. She gave the convocation speech at the Harvard Graduate School of Education yesterday, meant to inspire the soon-to-be graduates ahead of going out into the real world. And what important messages does Ms. Saujani want them to walk away with? Let's find out. I know it's traditional for a commencement speaker to start off with a joke, but anyone who knows me knows that I'm super impatient and a little ADD, so I'm just going to cut to the chase. Efficiency. I can appreciate that. You are graduating at a crazy time in history. I'm talking like top five earth-shattering, paradigm-shifting moments in human existence. Does this have anything to do with the success of the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Because I wholeheartedly agree. There was the Enlightenment. <laughs> the American Revolution. The Industrial Revolution. The Digital Revolution. And now automation is going to change everything about the way we live and the way we work. Automation. Oh, right! The robots! Robots taking over the world was the subject of my very first YouTube video. I already feel prepared for this. According to McKinsey, 45% of the tasks that people do manually are going to be automated using current technology alone. And the pace of innovation? It's never been faster. That means the future is going to look nothing like the present. Now, I'm not a historian, but I've been thinking about those, ever, uh, those other revolutions, the ones I mentioned a second ago, and it turns out they have some things in common, like they brought sweeping change to the world. Sweeping change. Got it. They were the product of incredible vision, courage, and creativity. Vision, courage, creativity. Got it. And, oh yeah. They were led by white guys. Led by white guys. You have a distaste for the accomplishments of white men, do you? Tell me more of your racial and sexual intolerances. Now, don't get me wrong. I love white guys. <laughs> I totally believe you. Your sarcastic tone and the audience's laughter are what really sells me on that true. White guys are, they're some of my best friends. Ah, playing off the some of my best friends are dot dot dot. Hilarious. So then you have no white friends whatsoever? Or you're using the same defense a stereotypical racist would use? Which one is it? They are. But let's be real. They have never had a monopoly on good ideas. They've just occupied a platform that the rest of us haven't had access to. You listed off five of the major revolutionary periods in human history, attributed these advancements to white guys, but they don't have a monopoly on good ideas. Got it. And it's not that they had good ideas, it's just that they had access to a platform that others do not. What platform was that during the Enlightenment? What platform was it during the Industrial Revolution? What do you mean by platform? And the good news is, is that platform, it's no longer out of reach. In the last half century alone, women and people of color, we've been climbing. Women now earn the majority of bachelors, master's, and doctoral degrees. So graduates, give yourself a big pat on the back. I stipulate to that entirely. Now, tell me, degrees in what subjects? Today, some 40% of American women are our family's breadwinners. We are so close to equality, and yet we have a problem. So things are advancing in such a way that you prefer. The barriers have fallen, and there's nothing to say things will not continue following this trend. 
But there's still a problem. Well, please do edify me. Because the next revolution, it's underway. And its leaders, they don't look like me. They look like tomorrow's commencement speaker. Huh. And who is tomorrow's commencement speaker? Oh, Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook. And it's true, he doesn't look like Miss Saujani. So, what Mark Zuckerberg looks like is the problem, is it? His gender, his race. Got it. And apparently the graduating class of the Harvard Graduate School enthusiastically agrees with that sentiment. Got it. And look, I don't mean any shade to Zuckerberg. <laughs> I totally believe you. It's your sarcastic tone and accompanying laughter that really sells me on that. He's brilliant, and he's a really good guy, right? Right. But America, it's a big, beautiful, diverse country. And for all the progress that we've made, we are still vastly underrepresented in Congress, in the C-suite, and then in the tech community. Who is we? And why should any individual be representative of anyone but themselves? So why? Why aren't there more women in power? Hillary Clinton won the popular vote in this country for President of the United States, the highest office an individual can hold in this country. She lost due to the balancing act of the Electoral College. There are women on the Supreme Court of the United States. Nothing is holding women back from achieving positions of power in this country if they work to attain them. Just the same as men. There's no, pro there's no question that it's a structural problem. From workplace discrimination to systematic sexism to the lack of paid leave and affordable daycare, women just face extraordinary challenges that men just don't. Discrimination. Sexism. Well, you would never promote such notions yourself, of course. Lack of paid leave. Affordable daycare. These things only affect women. They don't affect husbands and fathers in two-income households. They don't affect single fathers. Got it. But there's another challenge that we face, and it's not structural. It's cultural. In our society, we train our boys to be brave, to throw caution to the wind and follow their passions. And we train our girls to be perfect, to please, to play it safe, and to always get straight A's. All boys are raised one way. All girls are raised another way. Boys are never encouraged to get straight A's. Girls are never encouraged to follow their passions. Girls never throw caution to the wind. And boys never play it safe. Got it. The result? Girls are kicking butt in the classroom, but they're falling behind in the real world. Girls are falling behind in the real world. You just told us that women make up 40% of primary breadwinners in this country. Working women. Are they not part of the real world? Are those numbers declining over time or rising? Hmm. And that's because in the real world, success is the product of bravery and not perfection. And if we don't start treat, teaching our girls to be brave, they're going to miss their chance to code the future in Silicon Valley, to build the future in the C-suite, and to legislate the future in Congress. No one teaches girls to be brave. Wow. Then there are some lousy mothers out there always raising their girls to be cowards. Shame on them. And women are going to once again find themselves and their ideas on the sidelines 
of the revolution. And we can't let that happen. Nothing is more important than solving this problem. Nothing is more important than solving this problem. Well, which problem is it then? Because the problem before was that the leaders of tomorrow look like Mark Zuckerberg, rather than you. Now the problem is that girls are not trained to be brave. I wonder if there are 97 more problems we're going to be told about before this speech is over. And that's what I need you to do when you walk across the stage tomorrow and you go out into the real world. The real world where women are falling behind. Got it. Our speaker then goes on to provide a long and personal biography regarding her educational and career ambitions, culminating in a Master of Public Policy from Harvard and later a Juris Doctor from Yale. Let's jump ahead to where she speaks about her career after she completed her education. When I graduated, I didn't end up doing social justice work. I couldn't resist the pull of the next perfect credential. I followed my classmates to a job at a white shoe Wall Street law firm and spent the next six years defending bankers and hedge fund managers accused of securities fraud. Yep, so pretty much the opposite of social justice. Yeah, I guess that would fly in the face of wanting to do social justice work. And you did it for six years before moving on to your next job. You're going to tell us what you became involved with after that, right? Right. Fast forward to 2008, when I was watching my mentor, Hillary Clinton, give her first concession speech. Whoa, 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 whoa. Fast forward to 2008? Wasn't there something you were involved with beginning in 2005? After the law firm, but before Hillary gave her concession speech? Saujani later left the law firm to join Carrot Asset Management. Carrot's principal owner, Hassan Nemazi, was later convicted of running bank fraud and Ponzi schemes stealing hundreds of millions of dollars to finance his lavish lifestyle and support his access to top Democratic politicians at political fundraisers. Saujani, despite serving as a top manager and despite her extensive experience with security fraud issues prior to joining Carrot, claimed no knowledge of the fraud. Saujani then joined the Carlyle Group, another asset management company, that failed to pay margin calls after engaging in credit default swaps on Saujani's watch. Interesting you would leave that time of your life out of your story of success, but it's probably just an oversight. Cut for time, I am sure. Let's get back to our speaker's meeting with Hillary Clinton in 2008. She said something that resonated with me. She said, just because she had come up short, that didn't mean that women should be discouraged from aiming high. Yes, I can totally imagine Hillary Clinton seeing herself and her first presidential campaign as pivotal to other women and girls assessing their own value or prospects in the world. Because before Hillary, there were no successful women. That's when it all clicked. All those years of working and waiting for a credential, that wasn't aiming high. That was aiming low. Spending years working to achieve a master's at Harvard and a doctorate at Yale, becoming a successful lawyer and hedge fund manager, that was aiming low. Well, you did say girls are trained to be perfect. I guess you never know when enough is enough. So I quit my job. And I decided to run for Congress. Quit your job? Well, which job was that? Was that when you were acting as Deputy General Counsel for Fortress Investment Group, the third hedge fund you worked for? You know, doing the opposite of social justice. Right, so in 2010, you ran for Congress. How did that go? I lost. Badly. Yes, you did. And how badly? Carolyn Maloney won the primary by receiving 81% of the vote to Saujani's 19%, 
winning Manhattan, Queens, and Roosevelt Island portions of the district across the board by decisive margins. Saujani received 6,231 votes, despite her campaign's expenditure of $1.3 million, spending more than $213 for every vote she received. Wow. And, huh, well, look at who supported you during your campaign. Randy Zuckerberg, director of market development for Facebook and sister of Facebook co-founder Mark Zuckerberg. You remember Mark, don't you? The guy whose looks are a problem for you? But I guess the color of his sister's money was totally acceptable. Three years later, I ran for New York City public advocate and lost again. Less badly, but still pretty badly. It's true. You came in third in the primary phase. But, huh, didn't, didn't your campaign do something during your run for public advocate? Something kind of shady? Oh, that's right. You had your Wikipedia page scrubbed of your history with working for hedge funds. Gosh, omitting your Wall Street career from the record during your campaign and during this very speech, the kind of work that would belie your claims of striving for social justice. How very odd. I won't lie. Too late. It hurt. But also, it was amazing. Not being perfect was liberating, and chasing my dream and not a credential was the best decision I ever made. It, it turns out... <laughs> it turns out that when you get a taste for being brave, it's kind of like a rush. It's hard to stop. Yes, a taste for being brave. Brave enough to blame the lack of women's progress in society on white guys and the bravery that comes from obfuscating your own past. Yes, brave. And that's how I started Girls Who Code. Okay, now we get to Girls Who Code, her current project. I'm looking forward to this segment. During my first campaign, I visited a lot of New York City public schools, and I would go into their computer labs, and I'd see labs full of boys learning to code. No girls in sight. I was baffled. I mean, I knew that Silicon Valley was a boys' club, but I didn't know that that club started in high school. Well, obviously there were laws that said girls are not allowed to learn how to code. There must have been dozens and dozens of girls clamoring to learn how to code, but the school was just not letting them do it. And it's the same for all of those boys who never learned how to code. Like their female peers, they're being prevented from learning how to code. It's not that they are pursuing their own interests or anything. Not at all. And that pissed me off. I wanted to do something about it. But this time, I didn't ask anybody for permission. I didn't wait until I had that perfect credential. I didn't even bother to learn how to code. Huh. So, you had no interest in learning code either. How very interesting. I just went for it. I called up a friend who lent me some office space, and that summer we brought 20 girls together from New York City for seven weeks, and we taught them to code. I assume you mean the royal we, since you didn't know how to code. Five years later, we've taught 40,000 girls in all 50 states, effectively quadrupling the talent pipeline. This is not a bad thing. And I am not meaning to deride the success her nonprofit has produced for and on behalf of those girls. I just find our speaker to be racist, sexist, and very disingenuous in her rhetoric. So, what's the lesson? My obsession with perfection, with pedigrees and credentials, it was a dead end. Harvard, Yale, Wall Street. Dead ends. Got it. Like it literally led me to a funeral. <laughs> okay, so she's referring to a story she told earlier in her biography portion where she attended the funeral of someone 
who was going to write her a letter of recommendation to Yale, but who died before that could happen. So she used the advent of attending that man's funeral to solicit support for a bid to Yale from a colleague of the deceased. Again, she did this at the man's funeral. And no, I am not kidding. At Leon's funeral, I met the assistant to the dean of Yale Law, who upon hearing my story offered to make me an appointment with the dean. I got on that next train to New Haven, and before I knew it, I was standing before the man himself. <laughs> All that time that I spent chasing Yale was time that I could have been used to actually make a difference in the world. Bravery, not perfection, was the key that has unlocked every door that I have walked through since. Yes. Brave. Very, very brave. Mark Zuckerberg gets that, by the way. Right? He was just a sophomore when he dropped out of Harvard to start Facebook. He could have totally failed, with no bachelor's degree to fall back on, but he just went for it. It's such a white guy thing to do. <laughs> so, now you admire white guys? Or only white guys that take risks like that? I'm confused. But it took me 33 years to figure out that brown girls, we can do white guy things too. It took you 33 years to figure this out. After graduating from Harvard and Yale, after working for three hedge funds, brown girls and white guy things. Got it. But today's young women, they don't have 33 years to waste. Our world is transforming, and if girls and women don't step up now, they're going to be left behind. Girls and women are not stepping up. Hmm. And that's why I'm counting on you. I'm not an expert in education. I only know from what I've seen in my own life and what I've observed at Girls Who Code. So you're not a historian, and you're not an expert in education. All of your information is anecdotal. Got it. But the girls in our program, they're brilliant. They're talented. They are just as capable as the boys. But... But they're afraid. Afraid of imperfection, of critical feedback, of trying something that they may not excel at right away. They are afraid of critical feedback. That's a very interesting notion you just gave us there. Now, being afraid of failure, that's common in humans in general. But afraid of critical feedback? I am sure she won't elaborate, but that's a very curious claim. They figure out what they're good at early on and they stick to it. They avoid less intuitive, more competitive subjects like coding and STEM. They're not taught to be brave the way the boys are. Wait a second. At the beginning of this speech, you said boys are trained to follow their passions, with the implication that girls are not trained to do so. But now, if a girl finds something she's good at and sticks to it, that's not them following their passion? That isn't brave. If they're not interested in the things you want them to be interested in, that's an example of cowardice? So what can we do? We can't topple the structures without addressing the culture. The culture is the problem. And the solution, graduates, it's you. The culture is the problem. So white guys aren't the problem. Not training girls to be brave is not the problem. Now, the culture is the problem. Is this the same culture in which you earned degrees from Harvard and Yale, worked for three hedge funds, and ran for public office with a $1.3 million war chest? A culture where, as of 2015, you were paid $225,000 to run a non-profit. 
that culture. In whatever capacity you pursue a career in, in the field of education, you or the people you manage or teach will be some of the most influential role models in a young girl's life. Field of education. That's not competitive or STEM related. All the women in your audience must be such cowards. So here's my ask. Don't let our girls play it safe. Don't let them limit themselves to the thing they think they're best at or the thing they think they should do. Push them to be brave. Push them to where they may not want to go. Push them towards things they may have no interest in. If they resist, they're not being brave. Got it. Push them to take risks. Reward them for trying. How about you reward them for succeeding and not emphasizing that half measures are acceptable? Let's challenge our girls to step outside of their comfort zone and tiptoe out to the very edge of their abilities. Because if you do your part, if we all do our part... Does all also include white guys? Because they're a problem, you know. Then we will unleash the most badass generation of women leaders the world has ever seen. Yes. Hopefully all girls will one day have the opportunity to obscure their work histories to improve their optics in political contests. We can dream, can't we? I know every graduation speaker says it, but class of 2017, you are really going to change the world. Thank you, and congratulations. I agree. I think the current generation is going to change the world. But if cheering at the denigration of people based on their race and gender, and applauding the notion of pushing girls away from their own choices is what that change is going to look like, then that's not a world that I look forward to living in. As always, thank you for watching.